many ways, our nation started with the end of the Revolutionary War, but the real story goes much further back. I'm here at the first permanent British colony that was founded in 1607, a Jamestown settlement. This small group of people made a huge impact on our folklore and character. I will be preparing foods of the era in honor of our earliest pioneers, all to give you a taste of history from Jamestown settlement. Wow, spectacular. In honor of the settlers of Jamestown, I'm preparing a cornmeal, wild rice, cranberry stuffed chicken that inspired me when I visited Jamestown. Three of the ingredients are exclusively American, such as the cranberry, the wild rice, and the cornbread. So the first step I'm going to do right now, I'm going to show you how to cook the wild rice. So wild rice is a grass, and it's a tall grass that grows in wetland, mostly in marshes. So they would take the canoe out and they would shake the tall grass and what falls out is the grass seed that looks like that. It has a really nutty flavor, it's very unique. Not too much common because it's a complicated recipe to cook. So I got a Dutchie nice and hot. What I have here, I got some schmaltz. Any kind of rendered fat you could use. Schmaltz is my preferred method for that. So I got onions, very chopped. I got some garlic, onions, garlic. I got some carrot, some celery. All right. Any kind of wood vegetable goes in there. Really, no right, no wrong on this dish. And then I'm gonna add in the wild rice. A little bit of salt, a little parsley. All right, let's go back on the fire. I have chicken stock already made. I'm just straining. Anybody that wants to make the recipe at home, be alert. It takes about 55 to 65 minutes to cook at a very low heat. In 1607, English settlers arrived on the shores of North America to establish the first permanent English settlement in what is now Jamestown, Virginia. In doing so, they would go on to alter the course of history in unfathomable ways. Supported by an investment group in England known as the Virginia Company of London, Colonists were sent to North America seeking new financial opportunities. A lot of them were down on their luck. You know, they had businesses that didn't work out, and they were hoping to recoup those losses in this newfound land of Virginia. Within the first few years of the settlement, excitement quickly vanished. Many unsuccessful attempts at developing export goods had failed, and a lack of understanding of the climate led to starvation and disease. Desperate for knowledge of the area, Colonist Captain John Smith sought out help from local natives and soon established a trade relationship with Chief Powhatan. John Smith and the colonists wanted to befriend them so that they could find out where all the resources of the country lie, and also because they thought they could use them to supply food. Powhatan, who was the paramount chief, was welcoming because he was at war with other Indian groups. He saw the English with their weapons. Wow, you know, they can help us in that, in that warfare. They also are bringing me copper and I can control it because it's right in the middle of my territory. So those sort of things played into the fact why Powhatan didn't immediately attack when they were really vulnerable and he could have wiped them out. John Smith's sudden return to England, combined with an untimely drought in the region, ended the trust with the Native Americans. The scarcity of food and supplies would lead to warfare and a period known as the Starving Time. Powhatan decided he'd had enough of the English. They were 
becoming too demanding of food, which he was unwilling to provide. They were also trading with his enemies. So he ordered his warriors to lay siege to the fort. If anybody went outside the fort, they would be killed. A period of peace ensued when the famed daughter of Chief Powhatan, Pocahontas, married colonist and tobacco planter John Rolfe. It was Rolfe's successful cultivation of a sweet tobacco that would finally kickstart Jamestown's economy. That was the commodity that everyone was looking for. Tobacco really is what saved Jamestown. There was cash flowing in and the product flowing out and there was a reason to keep the colony going. Jamestown's most enduring legacy is that its successes compelled Britain to continue its ambitions of global expansion. The settlement at Jamestown would remain until 1624, when Virginia was formally established as a royal colony, a status that would remain until the American Revolution. So early this morning I got started and uh, I had my cornbread in the beehive. I'm gonna get the cornbread out and I'm gonna start breaking down the cornbread and putting all the other ingredients together so eventually I can uh, stuff my birds. All right. I just brought up some stuffing already made but I'm gonna show you how to make it. So the cornbread I took out of the oven. Now I'm gonna crumble it up. Beautiful. This stuffing is just spectacular. Now we're gonna put this to the side a little bit while I cut down some bacon quick. It's the same bacon that you find in the stores already uh, the cut in layers. It's the same idea, except it's a whole piece. So I'm gonna chop the bacon, small dice, like so, and add it right into my bowl. Then I have the cranberry, and the cranberry, what I want to do is just want to chop them a little bit to release the flavor that's in it. No big science to it. You just want to chop it to release the, the tartness that the cranberry has, a little tart and sweet. Makes the stuffing so absolutely spectacular. Add this into my bowl. And then, I took the root vegetables you see right here and I sweat them down a little bit. No color, just to make it translucent, like you see right here. A little bit of mushroom. It doesn't need really any salt because the cornbread is seasoned by itself already. And we're gonna put a little bit of uh, nutmeg in here, not a lot, because the flavors are a little different. Here we go. Now I'm gonna check on the wild rice that's cooking behind me. Beautiful. I said 50 minutes to 60 minutes or thereabout when you cook it from the raw stage. Soak it overnight, you maybe cut back the cooking time by 20 minutes. I like the flavor better the way I cook mine. Which matter of fact, now I'm ready to insert or to add the wild rice to it. When the wild rice is cooked, it opens like that. So since wild rice is very expensive, you may not find it very often served in today's restaurants. But here in the Taste of History, we do everything accurate to the 18th century, so half and half would be good. What I want to do now is add some parsley. There we go. Freshly ground pepper I want to add here. There we go. Salt it doesn't need. Back to the fire. I have chicken stock already made. Got the flavor of the cornbread and the wild rice and the vegetables, just spectacular. So now you mix it all together. You want to make sure that you have enough liquid in there so you can stuff the chicken. I've made some ahead already, so it can sit up a little bit, but it's exactly the way it is. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? And the, the flavors. One thing about wild rice, once you start using it once, you're going to look for it again and again, because it really is beautiful. Hello, chef. Welcome to Jamestown Settlement. It's nice to have you here. Right now we're standing on one of our recreations of the three ships to bring the settlers here for the first permanent English colony. I'm curious, why they picked that spot right here, do we know? So they're surrounded by water on Jamestown Island and they have a clear view of what's coming upriver. They also have a very deep port so they can moor the ships very close to the land. 
Do you guys have any record of the journey, how long it took from London to here to Vinor exactly? We know the first voyage took about four and a half months, but that was longer than it would normally take because as soon as they start to leave, they get held up without wind for six weeks. So they sit for six weeks waiting for wind and then they're able to get on their way. Well, welcome to our recreation of James Fort, named after King James. They start building this fort pretty much as soon as they get here. And, and the reason they're here is to go outside of the fort and to look for ways to make money. They think they're going to come over here and find immediate riches. What they find is that it's a hot climate, conditions are harsh, there's never enough food to eat. They're not finding as many natural resources as they would have liked. It had to be quite an undertaking to, to build a fort like that, wouldn't you think? I mean, Oh, definitely, yeah. They build the walls to protect themselves against possible Spanish finding them. And of course, sometimes they don't get along with the Powhatans, so they have to worry about people possibly shooting at them when they leave the fort. But they actually had to worry about two. They, they had two enemies and... they had to worry about, yeah. yeah. Well, what we have here is a matchlock musket. It's going to be the most common weapon here at Jamestown. Uh, and its basic operation is to begin by loading the pan at the rear of the weapon. The process will start by priming the pan. Close the pan so the powder stays put. Make sure there's no excess powder outside the pan that could cause the weapon to go off early. And empty the remainder of the powder down the barrel. At this point, you would include the musket ball, the bullet, in on top of the powder to ram in on top of the gunpowder to keep everything compacted at the breech, which is what's done here with the scouring stick, ramming everything tight, seating the round so that it functions properly. At this point, recover the weapon. Take up your slow match, which is where the match lock gets its name. Make sure that cord is burning nice and hot. Fix it into the serpentine. Check to make sure it's gonna land in the proper position. And at this point, the weapon is ready to fire. All that remains is to open the pan, exposing the powder, aim and squeeze the trigger. Set your pace. <laughs> you might wonder why I'm making three chickens. Well, we got a hungry crew, as we always have on a taste of history. <laughs> Since we cook with so much flavor and so much gusto, everybody wants to eat. So anyway, the chicken in the 18th century parked right in front of me. It would have never been sold, frozen obviously, it would have never been sold without a head, without a feed, and they would go to a butcher to get it killed alive, or they had their own chickens in their yard. So by all accounts, this particular chicken was not native to the Americas. Uh, so the Virginia Company brought them along with many other types of livestock they brought along in the ships uh, to settle their colony in Jamestown. So now we go, the stuffing is made, you saw me do it. So now all you want to do, it's really simple actually, you want to take a little salt, put a little salt in the cavity, and for this particular recipe, I use just a little bit of white pepper. The reason for that is that later when you cook it, you don't want to see the black dots that black pepper makes. What I'll do, the best way to do it is, you just form it in a, like in a bowl size, and just stick it in the cavity, all the way to the front. Okay. Now we're going to tie the bird. First step is we take the wing underneath the chicken. Then you take a butcher twine, butcher twine below, get the string across, equal parts, tie it across, go underneath, go underneath, and bring it down. And then you take this entire bird upside down and you tie them really tight here. The heat can penetrate on both legs. So the stuffing is obviously inside the bird. The heat goes there, and if you cut it like that, you never have an undercooked bird. Now, for cooking, I have a roasting pan here. I'm just gonna add a little bit of schmaltz. A little bit of schmaltz, and I would assume that in the colony of Jamestown, oil would have been a really scarce commodity. But schmaltz would have been kept from the animals 
they would have slaughtered, so it would make more sense. All right, here we go again. We have a string, both, both sides, go like so. Go underneath, go underneath, pull it back, go through, the bird upside down, and tie it. And then it goes into the roasting pan. Here we go. Now, all I'm gonna do is put a little bit of salt on top, a little bit of pepper. So now I'm gonna cheat just a tad by putting a little bit of oil on top. Make the skin nice and crispy. Like I said, in Jamestown, oil would have been most likely complicated, but you don't need it for the flavor. If you're not sure when the chicken is cooked, the same works for turkey, wiggle the drumstick. When the drumstick lets yourself wiggle, the chicken is done. Now you wonder how I know the temperature in the beehive, right? <laughs> Let me see here. 375 degrees. You don't believe it? <laughs> All right, let's put the chicken in. I'll take about 25 to 30 minutes. Welcome, chef, to the Powhatan village. And what we do in this village is interpret daily Powhatan life to visitors as they come through. So, what was the relationship like between the English and the Native Americans at the time? The relationship goes back and forth. It's very ambivalent. They both try to get along for trading purposes. And the English wouldn't have found prime rib and Yorkshire pudding over here, so they had exactly, to adapt. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's going to be a little bit of an adjustment for them. Better than starving, you get used to everything. Better than starving, that's for sure. <laughs> basics of Palatine archery, which is going to be a pretty important way of how the people are getting their food. Using arrows that look a fair bit like this, with the heads depending on what it is that you're after. The largest of their points being out of stone like this, which is not native, has to be traded for and then broken or napped into shape. The Palatine boys would get a bow at about age five. You would practice every single day for hours a day. Nice, hey, sir. Hey, hey, hey. Woo! If I had to hunt for my own food, I would lose finally some weight. <laughs> this was a bad shot. <laughs> All right. Look at that. Fantastic. And warm, too, on top of it. One of the things that goes along with daily Powhatan life is cooking. Duck. She got properly dressed in this. Beautiful. So I get to try a piece of you this duck? You do, yes. No metal tools for the yep. Powhatan, so Not it's then. all stone. Good? Really beautiful. Thank you, thank you. I could get used to living with you guys here. Eating this kind of food, mm -hmm. having U.S. company, awesome. and, look, and look at my fur, <laughs> I got it made. Looks very good on you. <laughs> <laughs> so the chickens are in my beehive behind me. While they're cooking, I'm making what I call a ragu of root vegetable, that's the, the base where the chicken gets served on. And the ragu of vegetable is really any kind of vegetable you want to use. Dutch is getting hot. I have the schmaltz over here. I have a parsnip, onion, beautiful rutabaga, celery root, carrot, got a cup of garlic cloves. Deglaze a little bit with chicken stock, cooking it down. And it's just cooking on its own heat until the chicken stock evaporates. The trick is only to cook the vegetable down, the, the ragu, that is still, you can identify the individual vegetable in it. And so now I'm adding in a lot of herbs into it to give this unique flavor. I have green onions or scallions, I have sage, I have parsley, and I have tarragon. I let it sit here until my vegetable behind me are more reduced down. And let's see. Just perfect. It still has a bite, but it's still in between al dente. Perfect timing to eat the herbs and a little bit of any kind of brown sauce and we're ready to serve it up. Perfect. A little, little bit of red wine. The goodness of the wood vegetable. 
the schmaltz, the herbs, sensational combination of flavors. Yeah. I'm gonna take it over to the lending. Let me taste a little bit. I just wanna taste for salt and pepper. Speechless. Not happen very often. <laughs> so let's check out my chickens. Get them out of the oven. Whew. My chickens, piece of art. I'm gonna put my ragu vegetable at the base of the bladder. Oh, it's amazing, the flavors. I'm just taking the bird and literally cut it down the middle. Look how beautiful the stuffing is in there. We try some of the stuffing right now here. Oh, ho, 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 ho. oh, cranberry, cornbread, little bacon, wild rice. Can I get better? Beautiful. Look at that. And this is my trip to Jamestown. I know a lot of people suffered greatly, but nobody's gonna suffer today with this meal. Look at how nice and moist. Oh, wow. Just fantastic. And this is a dish I could eat seven days a week, eight if there was. When I went to Jamestown, interesting enough, I was watching some of the Native Americans cooking and they had an Indian pudding. And you and I both know that Indian pudding is nothing more than a sweet polenta, if you come right there. It's cornmeal, exactly. milk, and a whole bunch of ingredients. So let's go do it. Okay. So, Chef, I've got some milk heating up over here over the fire. You see all that steam coming off the top? That's perfect. We get whisking and slowly add cornmeal in. Now we bring this to a boil. Yep. All right. Beautiful. Look at that. We don't want to take it too far on the stove, just enough till it's nice and thick, because we are going to bake it again later. Yep. So you keep stirring, and right. I'm going to add a whole cup of your best maple syrup. No pancake syrup. It's maple not the syrup. same. And some good molasses, about a tablespoon. If you like molasses a lot, you can go ahead and sub some of the yeah, maple syrup for I molasses. That's it's okay. It's a recipe that you can adapt to your own desire, if you will. That's you know? absolutely right. A pinch of salt, and then three spices. Cinnamon. Cinnamon. Ginger. And some freshly grated mace. Maize, which is the outer skin of the nutmeg. And now comes your specialty. Now which comes is, my own personal twist. Some finely is, chopped dates, or mashed, if you will. <laughs> you also could put the walnuts in here. Oh, yes, that would be a great it's addition. It's a great idea to start experimenting. That's right. Give it a good stir, break up those dates. It's good, right? <laughs> oh, that'd be my breakfast tomorrow, I'll tell you that. I never would figure I put date in mine, but now I know. I learned something new. Now Almost you know. something. So you picked up those uh, skillets for yes, that? Yes, this good idea. beautiful little one. You mm -hmm. can go any size you want, large, small. The only difference is probably going to be how long it bakes in the oven. For okay. something about this size, we're looking at about an hour uh, to really Very get slow. it. Very mm -hmm. slow. What kind of heat? 300, yeah. straight in the oven. Okay. And knowing you, you got one in the oven already, so I can you taste, right? You already know, <laughs> Chef. I already know. That's right. Okay. There we have it. As you can see, it's all bubbled up and nicely browned on top. It's hot a little bit, but nice and firm. Oh, such a great flavor. When you bake it, the flavors get more intense. So obviously it's baked together, so some of the liquid evaporates by the baking process, so it's more powerful than mm -hmm. even the one I tasted in an unbaked stage. <laughs> and it's beautiful. Thanks, Diana. Great job. To put together this Indian pudding, which is the finale to my episode on Jamestown, which was a somber experience, but you know, I learned so much what went down early in Virginia in 1607. All that for a taste of history.